Unused content and concepts have always engrossed me. Learning about all the different ideas that got thrown around in the development phase, or even some background world building not touched on in the final release, is just very intriguing. And recently, I found myself looking into the unused ideas and concepts of Monster Hunter, primarily the first one. Now, I have not played the original Monster Hunter. The closest I got was playing Freedom Unite back in the day, and I did not get far in it. However, learning about the original Monster Hunter and what it was meant to be, and how the series even got its start, was enjoyable enough for me that I wanted to share all this stuff with you guys in hopes that you get enjoyment from it too. But to start, a little history lesson. The original Monster Hunter on PS2 was the result of Capcom, who, much like a lot of people at the time, was enamored by the PS2 and what it had to offer. It had good processing power, online capabilities, and it wasn't the Dreamcast. So Capcom tasked their production Studio One with making three games that would take advantage of these features. The first of these games was Auto Mod Lisa, or as the announcer puts it, Auto Mod Lisa! That is the most Capcom game announcer that's ever been, and it's in a racing game. It's a nice looking racing game too. Really digging the cell shade aesthetic, almost looks like it would be an initial D game at first glance. I had never even heard of this game before making this video, and it looks arcadey enough that I kinda wanna give this game a try one of these days. But either way, the second game in this trifecta was Resident Evil Outbreak which took the old-school RE formula and threw it online, making it so randos all over the world could brave through the elements together, which sounds like the true horror if you ask me. And as you'd expect, the last game they made was Monster Hunter, and if you had never looked into how this game is, boy is it weird to look back on, especially if you're like me and you started at around 3 Ultimate. First off, you did not start off with a starter weapon for each weapon type. You only started off with sword and shield, and there were only seven weapon types in all. Great sword, sword and shield, dual blades, hammer, lance, light bow gun, and heavy bow gun. Yeah, no long sword, no hunting horn, not even a bow. Second, there were quite a lot of materials that were only in online quests, but this didn't just entail stuff like monster parts. It was also stuff like Dragonite Ore and Firestone, which means that if you didn't have the ability to play online, or went back to this game after the servers died, you had no way of making any of the equipment that required this stuff, which is always a joy. And the last thing of note, you attacked with the right analog stick. Yeah, it was supposed to simulate swinging your weapon, which I guess I kinda get, but as a result, this meant that camera movements were relegated to the D-pad, which means that yes, the claw was not a PSP only thing, it was in fact a thing since the very beginning. Add all these factors up, and the fact that Capcom barely advertised the game over here, and it's a wonder why it took several years for this series to take off in the West. That aside though, the really interesting thing about Monster Hunter is what it was originally going to be in all the things that didn't get to be in this first installment which without further delay, will finally be what we're discussing today. See, the original concept for Monster Hunter, while always intended to be a fantasy setting, was actually going to lean in harder into the high fantasy area, with D&D's classes, magic, and more. These details were disclosed in the Monster Hunter Illustrations art book, which is where 95% of the information presented in this video was coming from. In it, there's a section called Staff Comet, where three members of the staff discuss how the foundation of Monster Hunter was formed, but we're only going to focus on two of the members, Tomonori Kambe, the lead designer for the game, and Kaname Fujioka, the series' world supervisor and director. Mainly because the last one, Iraya, only speaks once and just talks about the butterfly armor, which, despite it being pretty and the artwork here being cute, not exactly what we're here for today. Kanbei and Fujioka start by saying, We started off with the vague idea to start an online action game. 
The core idea, which was to team up with others in an effort to defeat monsters, was something that was presented right from the start and never changed. We had it in our heads that this was going to be a fantasy game, so our ideas tended to gear towards magic and the like. The world as a whole was much more fantastical as well. I doubt any of us expected it to turn out as... analog. As you might have guessed by now, the early Monster Hunter world was pretty rough around the edges. It was all about killing, a simple concept that was easy to understand. We didn't want to dumb down the whole killing monster aspect of the game so you'd still get that full on with the present Monster Hunter world. We retained the basic idea of getting together with other people to take down the big baddies, but we did stray away from bringing any moral ideas into it. This is how the world of Monster Hunter gradually took shape. Which makes sense, you don't want to bog down a gameplay focused game by wondering about the ethics of hunting down big beasties, especially for the first entry in a new IP. Gotta keep it simple and focus on the core idea before splintering off into deeper constructs. This last bit I want to read before we get to the fun stuff is a bit of a primer that I want you all to keep in mind going forward. All of the designs and concepts that we had early on evolved with the world, but those design concepts were merely part of the project proposal and the real design work started once we had a solid grasp of the world we were trying to create. As I recall, we had the designers dishing out whatever crossed their minds as they tried to imagine this new world, and we selected the ones that really stuck out to put into the game itself. When we got down to the nitty gritty of what kind of game Monster Hunter is going to be really, that was when we dropped the whole magic system. One of the earliest concept movies we created showed a few hunters laying traps and luring a monster to these traps. In those movies, the monsters were always very generic fantasy monsters like red dragons. Not only were they archetypal dragons, we also had them climbing out of the depths of ancient ruins where they had no doubt been napping on a huge treasure hoard. So the game itself didn't have a strong connection to nature itself at first. Still, the whole hunter flavor was well established with the characters wearing pieces of the monsters they hunted, like scales and shells. From the brainstorming and planning stages, we eventually tried putting some of the ideas into illustrations, and the whole process took about two years. And now, I think we can get into the specifics of what exactly these illustrations turned out to be. I think we should start with the biggest section of the art book, the goblins. Many different types of goblins at that. From the standard kind that wore masks on their horns to act as decoys against predators, to the hyena goblins which were swift and could run on all fours while fleeing, a goblin type that mimicked monster hunters using their discarded or stolen weapons against them, the desert goblin who wore cacti on their head and buried into the sand to surprise attack prey, this cool tunnel goblin that had a mushroom-like mask and Looks like it would have glowed in the dark, and this other take on that idea where they instead use flash bugs to light their paths. And then there's the forest goblins, which as you can see were half tree, and had four classifications. Standard, Scavenger, Berserker, and Minor. According to a staff comment by Fujioka, all of these goblins were set aside for the longest time before the idea for them was turned into the Shakalakas from Monster Hunter 2. Fujioka goes on to say, I saw them as mascots, or some other cute presence like a forest critter or small tribe. Having said that, I can't really explain why these early drawings of them carry such a creepy vibe. Also as a quick side note, for people like me who started the series at 3, yeah, the Shakalakas were not a thing that was started there. They were from the game we'd never got over here in the States, Monster Hunter 2, or DOS. I don't know why it's called DOS, maybe they thought Spanish sounded cool. But either way, the last goblin I wanted to give attention to was this one, a cat-like goblin. It's to be assumed that this design in particular eventually led to the cat goblin moniker, which resembles the felines we know today. A very interesting idea that bloomed from this goblin phase was the fortress dragon. This is probably my personal favorite out of the unused concepts, and is one that I would love to see happen the most. This massive behemoth had formed a symbiotic relationship with the goblins, the goblins protecting its fragile shell from harm, while the dragon's immense size scares away any predators that would want to attack the goblins. My favorite thing about this monster, besides the just neat idea in general, look at how small the hunter is. And then how big this thing is. Like, 
Could you imagine if they put this thing in Monster Hunter Rise? Like you're wire bugging and running up this thing's legs and a bunch of cats are shooting arrows or firing cannons at you and you gotta seize the fortress, get to the shell of the dragon, you end up hitting it until it breaks, causing the whole thing to come crashing down. And the second half of the fight happens where you're attacking its exposed flesh while the dragon's flailing about on a rampage or something. Like, I know that's not the best or most original idea, but you could workshop it or do something, man. It's so cool looking. Having a monster where half of the challenge is even gaining the ability to damage it is not something that's been done often, and if my very small vernacular didn't make it apparent enough, I really like this concept and think it's rad. I really hope it ends up being in a future game someday, even if it's not in Rise. Alright, next I wanted to bring mention to this, the Prototype Wyvern. This is most likely what Kanbei meant when he said they had designed generic fantasy monsters like Bright Dragons, since it is a lot more standard of a dragon design than what we would get with the Rathian and Rathalos. But really, I bring mention to it because of how they indicate what parts of the monster would have been used for attacks, and what parts would be, well, broken or cut off to get materials from. It's a nice peek behind the veil in how the team views the monsters they design, or at least did, I don't know exactly if this method is still used internally nowadays, but it wouldn't make sense if it was. Here, we have another monster that has a symbiotic relationship, this time with the botany of the area. The crab monster using a demon cactus fills up on water at an oasis before traversing through the massive desert. This one is a bit more background based than gameplay centric, but it is still a neat idea. We have a lot of crab enemies in the series, but they're normally just standard big crabs with big shells and sometimes bigger claws, so it's fun to see something different, even if it didn't make the cut. Next up, we have the Panther Dragon, or Leopard Dragon as it were, most likely a prototype of the Narga Kuga. The information given is pretty interesting, such as this blurb for the model concept, informing the modelers that they should prepare several corpse models with the body cut in two or with a dismembered part such as head, tail, or wings. And the mention of several there makes me wonder if they really wanted to get visceral with the details and have the monster get torn apart in different ways depending on what side of the body you were cleaving the most. Another interesting part is the blurb about the wings. It says the hardened wings on its back act as a natural shield, and that by cutting its wings during battle, the panther dragon can be made vulnerable to ranged weapons, really pushing the cooperative angle of the game a lot more, which of course makes sense since Monster Hunter was supposed to push the online capabilities of the PS2. Seeing as most of the series can be tackled alone nowadays, we don't really see stuff like this often, but I dig more monsters that incentivize teamwork. Of course, I have to mention this part about the tail. By anchoring its tail to a tree with its sharp tail, the panther dragon is able to pull off many acrobatic moves. The tail can be crafted into axe-type weapons. Meaning that while the switch axe was still a far-off idea, they did think to have axes during the conceptual phase of the first game. Lastly, this mention of the horn being used to make a spear did at first make me think that this was where the seeds were first sown for the insect glaive, but then I was reminded that the lance was in the first game, and that probably is what happened to the spear. Still, it is interesting to think that an axe of some sort was almost part of the initial weapon lineup. Alright, now we have my second favorite monster design that didn't get used, the Mold Dragon, or Jaw Wyvern as it's labeled in the book. This thing has a heightened sense of smell, since, as you can see, the mold is kind of taken over its eyes. It meanders about, since, again, can't see, tracking you by smell. And the biggest thing of note, it attacks with mold breath, which would reduce the effectiveness of cloth and leather armor, and would make any food and herbs you brought inedible. So all of those well-done steaks to keep your stamina up, and all those herbs you brought to make extra potions would be at risk of getting completely wasted. Now, this concept has not been fully utilized to my knowledge, but we did get a monster that's blinded by moss, and that's the Black Veil Valhazak in Iceborne. I get why we never got this mechanic, 
since it might be considered too frustrating to deal with and would probably lead to people just avoiding it until they got way better gear and weapons to completely trivialize the fight. But much like a lot of these ideas, I'd at least like to see it once in any of these games. Next we have a sort of quick shot of monsters that either just have a design or don't really have much said about them in the book, like these tree-like beasts right here. This jelly frog that shot out eggs that hatch in the babies to defend the mama, a concept used amazingly for the Giganox in 3. This alligator flytrap-like creature that reminds me of that thing from Gantz. This nameless brute wyvern that looks like a prototype version of the Devil Joe. A condor wyvern. A lion dog wyvern that maybe was a prototype design for the Diablos? A Kirin that has scales and multiple horns, making me kinda appreciate the electric unicorn we got a whole lot more. This thing called the Crypt Hydra, which seems to have finally been utilized in the series as the Nakarkos. These two, the Coelacanth Dragon and the Eel Beast, which could imply that underwater combat may have been an idea thrown around as far back as the first game. Though the Coelacanth has not mentioned that you can ride on its fins like it's a Shadow of the Colossus boss, which would have been very interesting. And then there's this, the Gas Dragon concept, which seems to eventually give rise to the Yama Tsukami from 2, but it's labeled the Tower Octopus for this design in particular. And this Gas Dragon concept looks like a Zeppelin, which is <laughs> pretty funny. He's a chonky boy. I do want to spend a bit more time on the Gas Dragon though, because its design is really cool. It functions like a hot air balloon, heating the air inside of its head with a heated stomach, and controls its speed and altitude by expelling air from its holes and its limbs. All of which is super rad, and this Yama Tsukami prototype is pretty fun too. It has eggs blocking its gas organ, and it's said you can get rid of these to cause a gas leak. It goes on to say that if the tower octopus were to try and expand during this time, much more gas would be expelled that could result in a massive explosion if any source of fire were to come in contact with it. Which means that even if you were to make this thing go to sleep, it's probably not the best idea to bomb it. We talked about a lot in this video, but I'd say we are about ready to close this off with one final concept that still to this day has been left on the cutting room floor. A lot of people probably know about this whole thing, but a video about unused monsters and concepts from Monster Hunter would not be complete without talking about the equal dragon weapon. You see, one of the concepts during the design phase was that there was going to be this ancient civilization that, as you'd assume, would have technology so advanced and beyond anything that we in the present would have, and yeah, it's a pretty cliched idea, but this was back in like 2000, so it was still kind of fresh at the time. Either way, this ancient civilization was said to have committed a forbidden act that led to a great war between dragons and this civilization nearly met its end with the dragons almost wiping them all out. This forbidden act is known simply as the Equal Dragon Weapon. This... thing is the result of that civilization wanting to make something on par with an Elder Dragon, so they took the bodies of 30 dragons and mashed them together into this Frankenstein's monster of flesh, bone, and machinery. The artwork is so haunting. Just this massive, grotesque creature strung up in what the blurb explains is an ancient storage facility in some ruins. This decrepit bioweapon left to rot in storage for eons that this small lone hunter just stumbled upon good grief. If there is anything that I talked about the day that better represents how incredibly out there and fantastical they went with the concepts for Monster Hunter, it has to be the equal dragon weapon. And that will sadly do it for today. Trust me, I would have loved to make this a 50 minute plus video going over all the games and their unused ideas or prototype designs. Like this Legiacris that's a full on leviathan, this frog with a dragon for a tail, this massive whatever it is, and this monster that was supposed to resemble a fist who would punch the living tar out of your hunter before uppercutting them to the stars. 
Stuff like that I would love to tell you more about. But there's no translations for these books, leaving me with not too many options. Maybe someday I'll be able to gab about these, but until then, that'll do it for this video. With Monster Hunter Rise's expansion coming soon, I really wanted to get a video about the series done, since I will most likely be playing that game all of this month. I hope all of you enjoyed this video and thought it was interesting. And of course, thank you all so much for watching. Be safe out there. I'll see you guys next time, and take care. Special thanks once again goes to B17Balder for being a $5 patron on Patreon, and my other patrons for donating what they can. I cannot express how much I appreciate your continued generosity, and I thank all of you, even those who don't donate, for continuing to support me. I hope my irregular upload schedule doesn't bother you all too much, because sometimes it just takes me a while to script really simple ideas, and this video was no different. But either way, I'll stop talking your ear off. Thank you all so much again for watching the video, and I hope you all enjoyed it.